And they were like, no. Okay. They were like, yes! <laughs> Please do that! That would be awesome! We'd love to have the whole weekend to work on it some more. Um, and so, because I'm cranking through the summaries, but it takes me a while to get, you know, because remember how long it took you to do your review? I'm doing that for 50 papers. Right? So, it takes me a while. Um, and for each paper, um, I do several things. First, I read the paper, then I color code it. So I go through and I mark your paper uh, in different colors. So if I find sentences that are too vague, not good, you know, like, I'm not really sure what you're saying here. I'm unclear, the mess here, you're not being precise enough, I highlight that in yellow. And if you say something that I think is factually incorrect, like you actually say something wrong, the way you described it actually is misleading or inaccurate, it's green. And if you're saying something like, I don't even really think you need to say this, it's purple, right? So your paper's gonna be color coded so you can look at the paper and you can look at the colors and see kind of what are the things I need to work on? Do I need to be more clear in my wording? Do I need to make sure I'm more accurate? Do I need to be more careful about what I choose to include? Um, you know, that kind of thing. So you kind of look at it in general and get a sense from the colors uh, kind of what you need to work on. And then in the margins, there are also notes. So I am very paranoid about uh, plagiarizing. Yeah, that's in red, by the way. Red highlighting is. And since the plagiarism check is it on, is it enabled on that uh, on our Dropbox for these? Is there another tool we can use to double check? Um, actually, what uh, what we can do is if you remind me, uh, I can uh, turn it on. Just remind me, and I can go in and turn it on after class. I assume that there was a reason. No, no, I, I'm perfectly fine with you doing that. That's totally fine. So I'll, I just thought I had turned it on and I had When I have two sections, sometimes I think I turned it off for both. I won't turn it off again. So I just need to go in and turn it off. Okay. And then you'll be able to upload another, because you can keep uploading as many versions of your paper as you want. You can just upload another version and it should be your plagiarism check. Excellent. Um, so yeah. Um, so I do that, I'll color, I'm color coding papers, and then I also put uh, margin notes. I do all the feedback electronically, so you can look at it um, on your computer, your tablet, or print it out if you want to. Um, and then you have notes in the margins about proofreading errors, things you want to watch. Um, and then I also give you an Excel spreadsheet, and on that spreadsheet you've got the grids, just like on the peer review form, where I go in and mark. So after I've read your paper and color coded, then I go look at your form, and I go in and literally code, plus check. You know, so for everybody's paper, I do that. So that's how I generate your score for each section. So it takes me, you know, I probably spend half an hour, 45 minutes grading each one page paper. <laughs> so because this is your first chance to do this, right? So I'm trying to give you really good feedback so you'll have a good sense of what you want to focus on. Um, but what I would like to do is extend the deadline so that we go until Tuesday. For this class, it would be till Tuesday at 11. If you take a look at the syllabus, you'll see next week we have no lecture scheduled at all. Right? And that's because we're going to start, after we get the critique paper done, we're going to start working on our final paper, which is the synthesis paper, which is what we're going to talk about today. That's a big paper, 150 points. Right? The synthesis paper, I mean, the critique paper is also important. That's 100 points, right? So I want to make sure that you feel like you're strong going into it. That's why I want to make sure you have your summary paper back from me and your feedback, and you have a chance um, on Friday or Monday to come talk to me about your paper having seen some feedback from me. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to extend that deadline, so please make a note of it. Um, your, the revised version of your critique paper will now be due on Tuesday at 11 o'clock. Um, instead of having class with me, I'm just going to be posting more office hours on summer so that people can come do individual consultations with me as they prepare for their synthesis paper. Um, so the whole week before Thanksgiving break, can you believe next week is the week before Thanksgiving break? Then we have Thanksgiving break week. The Tuesday you come back after Thanksgiving break is the synthesis paper peer review. Uh, and then you'll have a chance to meet with me some more that week, right, if you want to. And then the final version of the paper, I think, is due at the end of the week. So you want to get that in, get that done, so that you can then start studying for the, yay, final if you have to take it. Um, so we're trying to get all that stuff laid out. But today what we're going to talk about is, uh, well, a couple things. We're going to talk about the synthesis paper, so you have an idea of what it is you need to do for that. 
Uh, we're going to talk about the article that you're going to be adding to your list of sources um, for this final paper. And I'm going to answer any questions you have, um, talk about some issues that you think you might be having with your critique paper. Um, and I, I want you to be thinking about what kind of feedback, if you could get any kind of feedback from the person who does your peer review, what feedback do you want? Right? What are you most worried about? I mean, you said, I'm most worried about plagiarism. So you might tell your peer reviewer that. Say, what I really want you to do, what would be the most helpful for me, is as you're reading the paper, please, if there's any sentence where you think this sounds just like a sentence from the article, you're like, here's a copy of the article. Here's my paper. If you see any sentences that you think are too much like the ones in the original, please mark that, because I'm terrified of it. That's what I'm most worried about. If you're like, I'm most worried about AP Skylet stuff, then you know, say, here, let's pull up the APA style stuff and please double check to make sure my running pad and everything is all right. That's what I'm most worried about. So you're going to have a chance this time to ask your peer reviewer to give you specific feedback. And I think I, I talked with the TAs last week and I think we agreed they're going to let you choose who peer reviews your paper this time. So think about who you might want to do it. Maybe you just want to exchange with a particular person. Remember, everybody has to do a peer review, so if we have an odd number, they'll have to be a trio or something. Okay. So, first, the synthesis paper. Okay, did everybody get a handout? Everybody's got a handout? Can you just get a handout? So, the synthesis paper involves, now we're, we're We've been building up slowly with our writing. We started off with the summary of a particular article, an article that we had done an article worksheet on, that we had talked about already pretty extensively, several lectures talking about this particular article, um, until you wrote a summary about it. And you practiced applying <coughs> APA style stuff to a paper. After you've done an APA style quiz and an APA style makeup quiz, and you know, you've talked about APA style stuff, so we're trying to start there at a, very, at a basic level, practicing writing about psychological science. Next step, the critique paper is taking that paper that you've done all that thought thinking about and doing some critical evaluation in terms of the different types of validity. Okay, so we're not throwing a new article at you, but gave you an article you were already pretty familiar with, so you could really focus on those different types of validity and making some kind of scientific argument. With the synthesis paper, we're kicking it up another notch. We're adding in another skill. Okay, so you're still going to do some summarizing. You're still going to do some critiquing. But now you're also going to add a dimension of synthesizing, which means you have to pull in another source. You have to talk about more than one source at the same time. And you're going to, so what we're going to do is I'm going to have you, I had you read this article. Also a teaching of psychology article. And similar length, so not super hard. Hopefully everybody had a, ch everybody had a chance to read it because it's not really long. Not too hard to read. And if you did read it, you know that it's on a very similar topic, right? Other researchers who are interested in trying to make research methods and statistics more engaging, more interesting, improve students' attitudes and everything about, uh, about taking this class and about the skills that we try to develop in this class. So similar topic, and now what you're going to do is you are going to write a persuasive essay. So again, another persuasive essay, but now it's going to be a comparison contrast essay of Stansbury and Monroe and this new article. So they've got similar, similar themes, they're on similar issues, but you're going to be evaluating now the two research studies in terms of the four types of validity we've been discussing this semester. And you're going to come to a conclusion based on evidence about which set of researchers did a better job of designing their study. So you're going to be applying the things we've been talking about all semester in terms of good research design, you know, making good comparisons, managing individual differences, making groups similar enough to compare, controlling extraneous variables, all those things we've been talking about all semester. You're going to take a look now at these two studies and compare and contrast them 
and come to a conclusion about which group did a better job. So, like with the critique paper, you're, the best way for you to start is make sure that you are familiar, I know you're familiar with Stanford and Monroe, because we've gone over that paper to death. But this, this one's new. And I'm not going to tell you. Here's what you should think about with regard to construct validity. Here's what you should think about with regard to statistical validity. You should know that. Right? You've done that now for Stansbury and Monroe. You have an idea about what those things are, what that's about. So this is your chance to show me how you would apply that knowledge without so much specific direction. So I want you to think now about these. I want you to think about what you could write in a single paragraph. Where, say you had to write one paragraph that was about construct validity. And you had to compare and contrast the two studies in a paragraph with regard to their construct validity. What would you write? And you don't have to answer that question right now. We're actually going to spend time on Thursday talking about this study in terms of the different types of validity. I'm going to give you an opportunity to come to class with your ideas. I'm not going to stand up here and say, so it was this and this and this. Like at the last article, I was kind of like, here's what we can do, here's what we can do, here's what we can do. I'm just going to stand here and go, tell me what you think. Let's talk about it. Right? Now it's your turn to bring the ideas and refine those ideas and see how you do and get some feedback from me before you write. So what would you write if you had to write about these two studies in one paragraph about construct belief? Think about that. Write that paragraph. Then you have to think about these two studies in another paragraph and talk about them in terms of statistical validity. What would you say? Compare and contrast. Another paragraph. If you had to compare and contrast them in terms of internal validity, what would you say? Fourth paragraph, if you had to compare and contrast them in terms of external validity, what would you say? So you want to think about the guts of the paper first, just like last time. So start by thinking about what, how you might evaluate. Now you're not just talking about Stansbury and Monroe, but now your topic sentence has to make some kind of statement about that lets you talk about both papers, right? Because every paragraph has to have a clear topic sentence, and everything in that paragraph has to be related to that topic sentence. So now you have to think about topic sentences that are going to let you talk about both studies in one paragraph. Once you've got those four kind of gut paragraphs done, then you want to think about, OK, so what's the big picture? When I think about what I had to say about these two studies in terms of each of these types of validity, which one do I think won? You know, which one, which group of researchers do I think did a better job with regard to the different types of validity overall? You know, or do I think that they're pretty even, but one group was really good with regard to this one thing, and the other group did the best with regard to this other type of validity? So you have to come to some conclusion. Who wins? And the whole, those paragraphs you're writing are all the evidence you're presenting about why you're coming to that conclusion. And then you want to think about the introduction. You need to have an introduction that clearly, that makes sense for talking about these two papers in comparison and contrast. They have very similar research goals. So it shouldn't be too hard to talk about why researchers are interested in exploring these issues and then introducing the idea that there are two different groups of researchers who try different ways of, uh, for ex to experimentally test new pedagogical strategies. So and you have to come up with a thesis statement. That thesis statement is part of, comes generally at the end of your introduction, and that thesis statement is what those four validity paragraphs in the middle should support. Okay, that's the claim you're making that you're going to then try and back up through the rest of your paper. So don't try and write your thesis until you know what it is you've got to say. And your conclusion should be a manifestation of your thesis with additional details that reflect important points you've raised throughout the rest of your essay. Now you've got, for this paper, three pages. Okay, not four, not five, three. And I'm not saying three with title, page, and references. I'm saying 
title page, three pages of writing, and then references page. So total five pages. Now, if you, as long as you stay, as long as you're three pages, I'm good, even if your word count is low, you get the three full pages, 12 point font, one inch margin, double spaced, we're good. If you are like, I can't do it in three pages, I need to use more words, the instructions say we can use up to this many words, then I will let you go up to the word count that are in the instructions without penalty. Okay. But you should be shooting for three full pages of argument, including introduction and conclusion. By the time you get to this final paper, that title page and that references page should be a no-brainer, right? There should be no APA style mistakes on those pages. Let me tell you, from the summary papers I've been grading, the most proofreading mistakes are coming on APA style stuff. People aren't capitalizing stuff correctly. They're not putting it in the right font. They're not putting it in the right size. They're not aligning it correctly. They're not using italics correctly or all caps correctly. And if you do those things enough times, you build up five, six proofreading errors, and then if you just make a few in the body of your paper, you hit 10 and you're done. So the APA style stuff, that's stuff that you can, you can very easily get right. So you will see when you get your summary paper back, which of those things were an issue for you. Uh, and I will also tell you that um, for this first paper, I'm being extra gentle when it comes to the penalty for proofreading. Okay. The official policy is 10 proofreading errors, and I'm done, right? I'm not going to read anymore. On your first paper, I'm marking up to 10 errors, and after that, I'm just, if you have 10 or more errors, I'm just taking away your APA style points, but I'm letting you keep your content organization points. Basically, what that means is, even if you have too many proofreading errors, everybody's still getting half credit on that. So you're not losing all the credit, even if you didn't proofread. But the standard's going to get tougher as we move on. I'm doing the same thing for plagiarism. If there's plagiarism in your summary paper, I'm going to mark it, and then I'm putting you on a warning. If it happens again, then I'm reporting you. Okay, so everybody's getting, everybody's getting a free pass, basically. You're going to lose some points because I have to penalize you, but we're, I'm trying to make it so that everybody can get as many points as possible on this first paper and still get feedback that they need. But the, those APA style things, I mean, you should, the running head thing, the page number thing, you should have that down. That should not even be an issue. Your references should be perfect. Your title page should be perfect. So that everything has to do with that body of your paper. Now, everybody's going to be using as their second article for the census paper this one. I know that there are some people who um, might want to look at a different article. And if you really want to do a different article from this one, you still have to do Stansbury Monroe, but you'll have to get the article approved by me and have to provide me with a copy of the article. But I personally think this is a good one to do comparison contrast. There are a lot of things that are obviously similar and things that are obviously different. So it's it, and also, it's easier if you're using the same paper as other people because everybody knows what you're talking about. If you pick a different paper to use as your second paper for the synthesis paper, then nobody else is going to know what article you mean, so it'll be harder for them to give you a good peer review because they don't know what you're talking about. They haven't read the article, so they don't know details. So if you want that alternative option, let me know. Um, but I would my strong recommendation is that you use this paper as your second paper for the synthesis. Does anybody have any questions about the synthesis paper? So we don't know yet. We have to think about it. All right, that's fine. So you have this. You also have the peer review sheet okay, that shows you. You'll see this peer review sheet is very, very similar to the critique. The main difference is when you get to the content section, instead of it just saying the author's assessment of the study's construct validity, it says the author's assessment of each study's construct validity. So it's very, very similar. The things you need to include are very similar. But you'll probably need to say less in terms of summary and more in terms of argument. Yeah. Um, in terms of organization for comparing the two, would you recommend doing it like 
discussing one, discussing another, coming to the conclusion of which is better, or kind of evaluating them side by side throughout? My preference is side by side throughout because this is a synthesis paper. And when we look at how people write about psychology in professional publications, we see that they talk about them all blended together. And so this is the skill we're working on. I mean, you know that as we read these articles, we see that they're talking about how these things fit together in one paragraph, multiple sources. And we're just trying to practice this with just two sources. And is it gonna refer to each as like, Right, so you'll do, we'll do the same thing. So once you have referred to a paper, you only need to cite each paper once per paragraph. But you do need to make it clear if you're going back and forth between two studies in a given paragraph, you can't just keep saying the researchers. You have to say Stansbury Monroe or um, Sirocco et al. Right, or Sirocco and colleagues. So you can say Sierraco and her colleagues, Sierraco et al, both of those are okay. But you need to make it clear um, who you're talking about. Since in a, in a single paragraph, you could be referring to two different studies. And that's part of what we're practicing is being able to go back and forth between two different sources. So if you wanted to, you can kind of do that parallel in one paragraph where you have your topic statement that you always talk about Stansbury and Monroe first and you always talk about Sierraco et al next. And then you have, and then you move on to the next paragraph. You can you can do that. That's fine. But I really would like to see you trying to integrate information about both studies in the paragraphs where you're talking about the validity. You can also, in your introduction, where you're talking about the two studies and what they did, you can say Stansbury and Monroe, 2013, you know, did this kind of study. Uh, in contrast, Sierraco, uh, Lewandowski, and Van Volkem did a different type of study where they did these things, right? And you describe it and then you make some claim about how well they each did the things. So you might be describing each study in the introduction in just one or two sentences. And then getting additional details about the study as you move through the paper. Other questions? Other things you could think of? So did you guys get a chance to read this paper? The super long three and a half page paper. It's not super long. Tell me about this paper. What things did you see that were similar with Stanford and Monroe? What were they doing that was, what things were kind of similar? Their research question. The research question was similar, right? They're also interested in what? What are they, what's the big research question, research issue they're interested in? We need students to be more interested in research methods and statistics. What's up with that, you guys, and your lack of interest? You see how hard we work trying to make this interesting? We're doing research, writing about it, what are you writing about it? What do you do? All right, so they're, they're addressing the same kind of research question. What about the, the comparisons they made? How many groups do they compare? Two. Okay, so that means they have a control group and an experimental group, because they do an experiment, kind of experiment. What kind of control group did they have? Is it a no treatment control, standard treatment control, placebo control, what kind of control group? Standard treatment control group. Okay. So what was the standard treatment control? What did they do? Well, lecture and passive learning. Lecture and passive learning. Same standard treatment control as in the other study, right? Okay, and what about the Experimental group, what they do? They designed and made their own experiments. It's amazing. It's like, you know, there's this idea that having students make their own experiments might actually be difficult. Um, so they, they're again, they're also comparing the passive and active learning. Right? Now they, if you look at what um, Sirocco and her colleagues did, um, what can you tell me more about the groups? Like, how many semesters did they gather data? And when did they gather data for the different groups? Remember? Two semesters. Two semesters, right? They gathered data for two semesters. Keep going. Did they gather data for both groups, both semesters? Hmm? One each. Which group did they do first?
which one would you do first? You had the method we've been using forever, and then the new method that we haven't tried yet, which one would you do first? The method you already know how to do, right? So they did the control group data gathering first, that was one semester, and the next semester, they switched it up. And what they do, what was their experimental manipulation? How did they change the way they taught the class? What'd they do? I know. I'm the one that's writing paper about it. What'd they do? Come on, you guys are um, you guys are seniors. You can you can look through the paper really fast and find the answer. You didn't read it. Now that's good. That's a good guess. Give me that. We just talked about that. Yeah. That is not cool. What did exactly did they do? What exactly did they do? Specifically, like what would? So we know that the active learning for Stansbury Monroe was play, you know, design and experiment and gather data using Dance Dance Revolution. Okay. So play a video game and design an experiment using a video game and then actually play the video game to generate data and then analyze and stuff. What did they do? What was the active learning thing that they did? Created, they were led through an experiment and created an experiment with <laughs> their professor and then created one in groups on their own. Okay, so what did they call this technique that the instructors were using? Scaffolding. Scaffolding. Imagine it's this idea that you start off with something easier and then you make it more and more complex gradually. It's like it's almost like we do that exact same thing in this class. Uh, it's almost like I read the paper and applied principles from scientific research to teaching this class on scientific research. Um, so yeah, so they started off, the students in the experimental group were learning about different kinds of experimental designs, and so they would get some lecture about the topic, and then they would read a peer-reviewed article about the stuff they were learning, and they would summarize the peer-reviewed article, and they would then talk about their summaries of the article, and then they would design an experiment using that particular design structure and statistic. And then, and they would do that with the faculty member. And then after they had done that, then it was their job to get into small groups, after they hashed out all the issues with the experiment that was developed with the other members of the class, with the professor's help, then they had to go, and as they moved through the semester, they got more and more responsibility with developing the experiments until by the end, they're doing their own experiments, designing their own experiments, doing data analysis and stuff on their own. So they use this scaffolding technique. They also, you know, they were also integrating the stuff about APA style, right? Getting students to write about their research in a scientific way. And so they could express the ideas in a way that a professional researcher would. So they're doing this over the whole semester. It's the whole class, the whole semester is using this technique, contrasting with a whole class doing the whole semester with the traditional passive learning, more passive learning techniques. Same instructors? Did they have the same instructors both semesters? If it were you, would you? Yes, why? Why would you have the same instructor in both semesters? That's right, it helps because then you have fewer, you have less variability, right? Same instructors both semesters. Okay, double check that, make sure they have same. That would be a, that's a useful thing because we know that's something they did do in Stansbury and Monroe. They had different teachers in every condition. This one, very, very possible to have, having done it over two different semesters. They could control, for example, the lecture content. Same teachers would mean you know, a lot of things were being held constant that weren't held constant in Stansbury and Monroe. Now, what kind of comparisons did they do? What kind of statistical comparisons? Were they hard ones? Were they those complex factorial design things? What kind of statistical, now, if you even haven't read the paper, where would you go look right now to find out what kind of statistical comparisons they did? The results section, what would you look for? Well, statistics, yeah, but what if they had a, oh, I don't know, maybe something like a table with data in it. You can guess right now. Come on. Show off. You can do, you can, you can find a table and you can take a look at this and you can say, oh, tell me, what kind of test did they run? T-Test. 
T-test and chi-square, because they're comparing two groups, experimental and control group. Now, if you're looking at this table, and you're having to guess, because you haven't read the paper, what kind of things they did their analysis on. Look at these. It says variable. What kind of variable are we talking about here? If they're reporting scores on these variables. Are these independent variables or dependent variables? Dependent. These are dependent variables, right? What are their dependent variables? Look at them. <laughs> APA style efficacy, right? That means how good do you feel about your APA style? What about this? Your attitudes about research, your skills and your, how you perceive your own skills and abilities with regard to research, how useful you think the research knowledge you have is, then your attitudes about statistics, skills and how good you think your skills and abilities are with regard to statistics, and how useful you think your statistics knowledge is. So their dependent variables weren't scores on a test of knowledge related to what they were studying. The dependent variables these guys are reporting are all qualitative kinds of touchy-feely things. How do students feel about what they're learning? This is all about their attitudes and beliefs and perceptions. Okay? These students, we don't really know much of anything about how much they really know about the topic. So we're not comparing and contrasting how well they learned. We're asking how they felt about their learning. And we know that that was another issue, right? Stansbury and Monroe was also interested in this, in this issue of, you know, are students motivated or interested? That's why they asked students in the video game condition, how much did you like what you did? You know? They didn't ask the other people that, though, because what were they afraid of, probably? They would all be like, we hate this, it sucks. So they didn't actually ask the other people how engaged they were, but these guys asked both groups of students, how engaged they were, how interested they were, how useful they thought what they were learning was. Um, so this is not about their knowledge, not about their tests in terms of performance. This is all about their perceptions. Now that's good, right? I mean, it, it's good to know how students feel about their learning. But I also have to wonder, as a teacher, I would also kind of want to know if when you teach them something, I mean, I'm glad when you feel good about your learning, but I'd also actually like you to learn something. Um, if you go take the, the GRE uh, test on psychology, right, you go take the, that specific test, they're not going to ask you how you feel about statistics. They're going to ask you to do statistics, right? So to me, it's also important that we know how they did. That's not addressed here. What they were really focusing on were the students' perceptions of the experience, and did this active learning make them feel more, you know, more positive about AP-style research methods and statistics and their abilities to use them? Yeah. Do you think, in a way, they were also relying on this on the student's perception of their skill to be kind of an accurate measure of? I just feel like students, if they had a big increase in their skill and ability in the class, then it would probably show. Well, I mean, that's, a, that's certainly a possible connection. Um, I do believe it's the case that when students, that students tend to feel better about stuff that they really understand than about stuff they don't understand. When students are confused about what they're doing and they're not doing well on tests or assignments, then they don't like what they're doing very much. <coughs> if students understand what it is they're supposed to do, and they feel like they have mastery, then they have much more positive attitudes about what they're doing. But what we don't know is, um, I mean, if the grades, the grade distributions were similar, we don't know if students, I mean, what if students liked it better but didn't do as well? We don't know, because we don't have any information like that. Um, but just so, th this is a main difference between the two studies, is the kind of dependent variable they looked at. They're looking at a very similar independent variable, but, uh, primary independent variable with regard to uh, instructional condition, but very different kinds of dependent variables, focusing on a different aspect of this issue of how do we get psych undergrads more motivated to help them learn? Because if students don't like it, they don't want to learn. So they're going to argue, they, you know, they, if they're demonstrating that these things are better for students in the active learning group, the experimental group, 
then chances are those students are going to do better. This is part of the puzzle, right? Just like Stansbury and Monroe is looking at another part of the puzzle. Rarely do we try to do everything, right? In one study, you might not, now it would be great, maybe we're gonna have somebody who says, you know what, I wanna do a, a partial replication of both of these studies and see if we can find a way to get both kinds of measures, the performance measure and the attitudinal measure in one study. That would be even better. Right? We could find out not only do students like it better, but they do better. Or even when students don't do better, they still have to feel better about it. You know, that would be good. What I would worry about is if students weren't learning as much, but they thought they were learning more because they felt good about it. And that's a problem if they're taking the GRE subject test in psychology and don't actually know what they're talking about. That would be an issue. So, the nice thing about this study also is when they talk about, in the discussion, they talk about their findings. They talk about, in a much more frank way, some of the limitations of their study, like the fact that they couldn't randomly assign students to be controlled condition in the experimental condition. They talk about how that's not something you typically do in a pedagogical study. You don't have control over that. But it's a similarity between the two studies because they don't know that we're convinced they did random assignment in Stansbury and Monroe. So here's something that's similar, which means that makes these results maybe more comparable in that they're both dealing with the same kinds of limitations given that they couldn't do randomization. Um, so what, how well did they do in managing other kinds of differences between the groups given that they couldn't do randomization to try and make those groups similar enough to compare from the beginning? Because they're also doing the between subjects comparison, right? Does anybody have any other questions about this article? Your task for next time, for our next class meeting, will be to come prepared with ideas about this study's construct validity, statistical validity, internal validity, and external validity. You have to come with questions and say, well, here's what I was thinking about construct validity. Because I'm not going to give you answers about that. If you say, here's what I was thinking about construct validity, how does that sound? Let's see what other people think and see if we can come, but I'm not going to generate ideas for you. I'll give you feedback about your ideas. But now, because it's scaffolding, it's your turn, Jordan. <laughs> We're scaffolding, it's so exciting. Um, now you know what that means. We're going to, now I want you to try to come up with some ideas of your own. And I'm hoping that for this part of the paper, I'm going to see more variation. Because I see in the, when I look at, uh, Typically when I look at students' critique papers, I see lots of the same points being raised and they're the points we talk about in class. For the synthesis paper, I like to see more original thought. I want to see you coming up with more original ideas of, of things that meet, that are relevant. Um, so come to class next time with those ideas. All right, next thing I want to talk about, if you guys don't have any questions about this paper, do you, do you think you can get through this paper and identify those issues related to different types of validity for next time? Four types of validity? Okay. So the next thing we want to do is we want to talk about what kind of feedback you might want when you get to lab today. Because today during lab, you're going to do peer review of a classmate's paper. Okay, their critique paper. And we talked about how, you know, everybody's going to have some things that they're particularly concerned about. Please take some time when you are looking at somebody's paper to find out what it is they want you to get feedback on. Um, some things, some feedback I can give you, having been looking at summary papers. You want to make sure that every paragraph has a clear topic sentence and that everything in the paragraph relates to that topic sentence. So, when you're looking at somebody's paper, if their topic sentences aren't clear, everybody needs to know that. Okay, so it needs to be, that's kind of, here's what the paragraph is about, now I'm gonna tell you my evidence to back up the claim. You also want to think about the strength of the claim and the wording that this, the person uses. Okay? Some claims, if they make a really strong claim, and they say, you know, the internal validity of Stansbury and Monroe 2013 was extremely weak. Okay? 
Okay? That's a very strong claim. You start throwing out words like extremely and weak, you're, you're throwing down the gauntlet. Okay? So you don't then want to put forward some wimpy evidence. Right? Internal validity is all about controlling for confounds. That means you want to go for the jugular and talk about how the conditions had different instructors, different numbers of students. I mean, you want to just you want to present some hardcore evidence to back up that hardcore claim. If you're going to make a softer claim, like the external validity of Stansbury and Monroe 2013 is most effectively, or you know, is easiest to evaluate once the reader has decided what elements of the study you want to generalize. Right? If it's not necessary to use the exact same active learning activity, then the study might generalize to a wider group of people. This dance dance revolution requires that the participants have you know, good physical mobility, good vision, good hearing. So they'll probably only generalize well to other young participants. But if a different type of active learning activity could be used that didn't have those same physical demands or expectations, this could probably generalize to a wider range of students or something like that, right? So softer claim, softer evidence. You also want to watch out for we. We've all learned don't say I in a paper, right? Don't say I. Well, APSL actually doesn't have a problem with you saying I if there's only one author for the paper. What it does have a problem with is you saying we when there's only one author for the paper. That's actually considered misleading. So you don't want to say, you know, we must assume that the researchers did blah, blah, blah. Yeah. No, we, who's we? You and the mouse in your pocket? Like what, what, what's the we thing, you know, who's we? So, if you need to say I, say I. That's fine. You can say I. But what you want to avoid is I-ing unnecessarily. So, if you want to say, I feel that the internal validity of Stansbury Memorial 2013 is very weak. Okay. Well, it's nice that you feel it, but I don't care. Okay. It doesn't matter that you feel it. Just go ahead and say it. Just say, the internal validity of Stansbury Monroe is very weak. Just go for it, okay? Obviously you think it, obviously you feel it, or you wouldn't be writing a sentence about it, okay? So don't I unnecessarily. If you can't get around I, then that's okay. But you don't want to I more than you need to. And you don't want to feel and you don't want to think more than you need to. Right? So don't I think, I feel, just, it doesn't matter. Obviously you think it, obviously you feel it. Okay? Or you wouldn't be writing it. So take those, I mean, I realize that they make claims feel a little bit less threatening and a little bit softer. Because you say, Stan, the internal validity of Stansbury and Moreau's experimental design was weak. That's kind of, right? You say, it seems to me that the, internal validity was weak. It seems like you're, you're hedging on it a little bit. You're getting a little bit nicer. Okay, and here's where I, this is where I'm going to pull the, the gender card and say, this is how women are taught to talk about others when we critique them. And I'm only springing this up because we have a disproportionate number of women in this class. Okay. We got some men representing, but we got a lot of women. Yes, okay? This is how we're taught to critique, to say, well, I could be wrong, but it seems to me that it could be that this is the case, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we're really thinking is, jackass. <laughs> <laughs> so don't soften unnecessarily. Your case is about your evidence. So if you have the evidence to back up, the internal validity of the, of the study's experimental design is weak. Because it is. You know it is. Okay? Then say so, pummel them with the evidence, and move on. That's fine. Now, that doesn't mean you should be like, they're 
are clearly incompetent because we're not doing that either. This is not, we're not going for emotional appeals or subject, you know, clearly they don't care about their students' learning experience. Of course they do. That's why we're doing this, right? So we're not, we're not attacking in any way. All we're saying is, I'm evaluating this. Here's my claim. Here's my evidence. That's pretty clear. Move on to the next thing. So you want to, as you're looking at your classmate's paper, think about the balance between the strength of their claim and the strength of their evidence. And look to see if they are softening more than they should. If you think they could be more assertive about their claim, or they could be stronger in their description of the evidence, give them that tip. Say, I think you can really push this a little bit harder. Or, I think this is a little strong. Like saying, you know, this study has absolutely no external validity. Okay, that's a really strong claim, and you're going to have to, back, that's going to be a hard one to back up in three sentences. Right? So, it's always good to, you know, get those things to match. Another thing students often struggle with is they look at this paper, and they look at this paper, and they look at this paper, and they think all the sentences make sense because they know what they meant to say. You've read other students' papers. What do you know? Sometimes they write sentences that make no sense. And it's not a bad thing, it's just that's how you learn, right? You learn to write better sentences by writing bad sentences and then fixing them. Not everybody writes brilliant sentences from the beginning. I will tell you, the best paper, the best summary paper I got, you know how many drafts the person wrote? Because the person marked how many drafts they had. You know how many drafts were on the revised paper? Eight. That person rewrote the paper eight times. It was one page, and they wrote it eight times. You get better by writing over and over and practicing. So when you're looking at somebody else's paper, if you get to a sentence and you're like, I kind of don't understand what this sentence means. Or when I read this sentence, it seems that it means this, but I know that that's not what happened. Your classmate needs to know that because your classmate probably thinks that sentence makes sense or they wouldn't have put it in their paper. So you can say, is this what you mean by this? Because when I read it, this is what it sounds like to me. Tell them, because if they knew, they probably wouldn't have done it that way. So give them, think about the kind of feedback that you would really want. And if you have a strength or you have a weakness, let the other person know. If you're like, I am a terrible speller. I am the worst speller on earth. I can spell check everything. But if I spell check it, sometimes it ends up spell checking in a real word that's not the word I mean. That happened, I think that happened a few times in papers I've read. People wanted to say something like, they wanted something like introducing or including, and I got things like infusing and implementing, and all kinds of, I'm just like, that's not the word you want. It's close, but not quite, okay? So um, you also want to help your classmates watch out for thesaurus writing. What thesaurus writing is? Yeah. You know, what is it? Finding synonyms? Yeah. Finding synonyms. synonym, the synonym search and swap. <laughs> I, I've read at least one summary paper so far where literally I could see, like I knew exactly what it was the person had wanted to say. But the person, I think, was convinced that that would sound too much like what everybody else was saying. So instead of saying something like the lecture, it was always the professor's presentation. <laughs> and then, you know, and instead of, you know, the, you know, they're just always different words. And sometimes they would get a sentence where, like, if they had used the original words, it would have totally made sense. But all the synonyms <laughs> together made it this kind of crazy thesaurus word salad thing that you're like, if I imagine other possible meanings for these words, I can totally see where you're going with that. So if you sense that the person is, is thesaurus writing, say, mm, you know, this sounds a little bit over the top, maybe, or 
you know, I understand that, you know, in the paper it says this, but just because you took, the, if you take the same sentence from a paper or a couple sentences from a paper, and then you just swap out all the nouns with and verbs with other <laughs> words, that doesn't make it your sentence, right? So, um, and you you can spot sentences like sometimes people I think when they're learning how to write scientifically, they read a scientific article and they feel like the researchers who are writing this are talking in a very fancy way. And so they feel that when they write scientifically, they should use fancier words. <laughs> you know. So I think the person's gonna like, you know, the the researchers wanted to increase the students' degree of effusiveness about the learning content or something. I'm like, do you mean that you they wanted to improve their their attitude about the course material, you know? But it was like increase the students' effusiveness. And I'm like, their effusiveness? <laughs> like, I, you know, I think about you guys all the time, but I almost never think about your effusiveness. <laughs> so, so I don't think the researchers did either. So it's, you know, just because it means something when you use the source search on Microsoft Word, that doesn't mean it's the right word to use. So help your classmates watch out for that. Are there other things that you would like feedback on, things that you're worried about, you, that, you know, if somebody decides they'd like to work with you, you would like, have them help you with? Yeah. Just like, just awkward wording. Cause some, you know, sometimes you write something you're like, I just don't know how else to say that, but it sounds really awkward. Mm -hmm. And sometimes someone can look at it and be like, oh, this would have been a much better way to say it. Yeah. Switch this around and take that part out. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, awkward wording. Wording that kind of works, but kind of doesn't. Another one? Um, not so much for the side paper, but on the first one, just trying to condense my writing and still let it be a full explanation or a full, like, let it be complete. Because I was like, I wanted to just keep below the wording and when I kept getting these wordy to do the paragraphs, it kept pushing over so I could take out wordy to make it from So some help maybe trying to, like, you don't need this, you don't need this. And that's where things like, I think and I feel, you can take those out. And you, know, you don't have to put all the berries and other things in there. Pull those out. You know, figure out where you can, you can be more brief. You know, the researchers is fewer things than Stansbury and Monroe. <laughs> you know, so try, but, oh, one thing I noticed a number of times in summary papers is that people would sometimes say, researchers conducted a study. The thing is that when you just say researchers, it sounds like you're talking about just researchers in general that nobody knows who you're talking about. But if you've already introduced Stansbury and Monroe, then you should say the researchers, because that tells me you're talking about the people, the researchers that have already been mentioned in the discourse. So sometimes cutting out words, you're like, oh, I don't need this. I can just say researchers. Well, maybe not. Okay. So it's good to help them if you see words that you think they maybe don't need. Or on the flip side, sometimes people edit stuff so it's so thin they actually take out words. And I found a couple cases where students had edited stuff down so far they'd actually taken out words they really needed to make the point they wanted to make, so that their point was clear. When they had taken out words, it made it so that it was more ambiguous. And if they had left in some words, it would have been more clear. So it's that cost benefit of keeping words in versus taking them out. Are there specific APA style points you have questions about, things you're still wondering about that you're not clear on? Yes? Okay, capitalization errors. Um, main capitalization errors that I observed. Uh, when it came to the running head, okay, the label the running head has a particular pattern of capitalization. People actually were putting the running head in all caps sometimes, where they were capitalizing both running and head. Only running is capitalized, head is not. Um, sometimes people also forgot to put the running head itself in all caps, and that should be in all caps. Um, sometimes people were capitalizing things in um, the title of the article in their references that they should have. Um, in the title of the journal, teaching of psychology, sometimes people were capitalizing of. And in fact, if you just cut and paste the reference from PsychInfo, it has that in it, it's a mistake. And it's been reported, we told them about it, but they have it all caps on there, and so I can tell when people cut and paste the reference from PsychInfo because they always have that one mistake. Um, 
So the of should not be capitalized in the title of the journal. Um, other kinds of capitalization mistakes. Um, you don't have to capitalize the names of the conditions. So you don't have to say experimental with an E and standard treatment control, capital S, capital T, capital C. You don't have to do that. Um, other things, uh, titles. Um, for the critique paper, I should not see the word critique or paper in your title. Um, I should not see Stansbury and Monroe in your title. So your title should be, you know, should be something like evaluating pedagogical innovation in psychology or something, but it should, it should reflect something original that's not the assignment, which is critique paper, or the source, which is Stansbury and Monroe. You don't need my name in it either. So it doesn't need to be, you know, evaluating a paper for Dr. Darnell. No. I don't need that either. Yes? Um, oh, did you still have that uh, example title page that we were able to look at during the review last time? Um, I don't have it with me, um, but the are, um, all you have to do is go to the Purdue OWL. You'll be able to look that up in lab. Um, I would go to Purdue OWL. Also, the APA style tutorial, the basics of APA style that you guys study for your APA style quiz. Um, you can go through there, and there are, there are links in that tutorial of PDF versions of papers you can download and take a look at. Um, so I would just take a look there so you can actually see the running head and all that. Um, another thing I saw in the summary papers, uh, I had one student who put their name, their last name by the page number. Maybe that was just a thing that they've done on other papers where every page would have their name on it. But in APA style, the only place the author's name appears is on the title page. So you don't want to have your last name next to the page number in the head. For the head. Yeah, question. Um, what is the level I was struggling with using the specific language that was in the paper with like, their terms, or whether you can say engagement or find another way to say it, no content condition. What is the level of that appropriate? Okay, so one thing that I have an issue with with this paper, and I think we talked about this a little bit before, is I hate the labels they have for their conditions because I think they're misleading. That's my personal thing. And there were many cases in the summary paper where people used the video game condition, the lecture only condition, and the no, uh, no content condition. And they just used those labels without explaining about them. So if, I, if I'm a reader and I don't know anything about this article and I see video game condition, lecture only condition, no content condition, just based on those labels, I don't get a good understanding of what each condition involves. But if those labels were very self-explanatory? If the labels are appropriate. So if you said, in the experimental condition, subjects did this. And then afterwards you continue to refer to the experimental condition. Or if you said in the uh, you know in the active learning condition, or if you even if you want to say in the video game condition, students engage in an active learning activity after listening to a standard lecture. Then every time you refer to the video game condition, I know what you're talking about. And then if you want to say the no content condition, you need to clarify that it was no content, no instructional content relevant to the test on vectorial designs. If you don't clarify that. I have no idea what they did um, in the, the lecture only condition. They didn't just do a lecture, right? They did a passive learning activity after what their, the lecture only part is reflecting that they, they had the lecture but no video game activity. Um, so if you, but you have to clarify that in your descriptions that I know when you say lecture only, what you're meaning is the standard lecture on factorial design followed by a discussion of examples and fake data. Um, that's so. I need you need to explain what each of those labels means if you're going to use their labels. Now, using their labels is not wrong as long as you give me that additional clarification. But if you don't, it's misleading to the reader because I don't know. Because when you say video game condition, it makes it sound like all they did was play video games in the class, and that's not true. But from the plagiarism standpoint, you can use their you can use their, their labels. labels. Yes. 
Now, here's another thing. People, they call, I mean, I, their labels for things drive me nuts. I think they're so non-descriptive. Um, they call their instructional condition, condition. And so people say, there was a main effect of condition, but they don't tell me that they're referring to the different instructional conditions. I'm like, I don't know what that means. You say there's a main effect of condition. As if they haven't explained to me that one of the, so if you refer to that variable as instructional condition before, and now you just say condition, because that's how they refer to it in their statistical part of their paper. I don't know what you're talking about, because you've not told me anything about a, something called condition. So you want to make sure you're consistent when you talk about, you call the variable instructional condition, and they had three types of instructional condition. Students were assigned um, to one of three types of instructional condition. And then you tell me the three types. Then afterwards, keep calling it instructional condition, because then I know what you're talking about. But if you just say condition, I don't know what you mean. And even though they did that in the paper, if it's not clear to me, because I haven't read the paper, right? Because remember, I have, supposedly haven't read it. Then I have to go, what? Like, what is that? What's condition? What do you mean there's a main effect of condition? What condition? I don't know what you mean. So make sure you provide the reader with sufficient information that I don't have to rely on any of my previously existing knowledge about the paper to understand what they did. When you, if you use their labels. And that's why their labels frustrate me so much, because they're not self-explanatory. If you haven't read the paper, their labels don't tell you what they did very well, except for pre-test posts. That one I get. But the labels for the different instructional conditions are really bad if you haven't read the paper and their descriptions of what each group it does. Yeah. Um, you mentioned plot. Our entire paper should be one plot like time mm -hmm. zero, right? Because we're not. That's right. Time, yeah. We don't have any tables or anything. So everything, including the header, right? Here's where people lose points. They don't put their running head and page number in Times New Roman 12 point font. It might be set on a different font in Microsoft Word for you. I've got people, so if it's not in the right font, you lose point for font, both for the running head and for the page number because they're two separate things. So make sure you get the right font for your running head and your page number, 12 point Times New Roman font. Go in and check it, make sure that it's the right font. But yeah, everything should be time to run in both my phone. Since I'm not making you do any tables or anything. And those would be in what if you were doing them? That's right. Okay, yes? I have a quick question about the running head and the mm -hmm. title. Mm -hmm. Is the running head supposed to be a sh it's supposed to be a shortened version version of your title? Okay. Yeah. So it can be the same as the title if the title is 50 characters or less, including spaces. But if the title is longer than that, then your running head should be a shortened version that's still coherent. So it shouldn't just be big words from the title slammed together in a row. It should be something, uh, some something that's clearly connected to the title of your paper. So say the title of your paper was. Um, Evaluating innovative pedagogical methods in psychology. Well, that's not going to fit in a running head. It's way too long. But you could have something like evaluating innovative methods. And that would be a perfectly good running head. Does that make sense? Remember, running head should not be longer than, not including the label running head, but the running head itself should not be longer than 50 characters, including spaces. Your title should not be longer than 12 words. And it, I mean, you should shoot for not longer than 12 words. Um, and it should not have things, the extra words like, you know, a study of the effect of blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, no, don't do that. Just extra blah, blah, blah. I don't see it. Um, so you want use words that count all the time. Other questions? Keep thinking. Here's your chance. Ask me stuff before you go work on this more. Yes. Should I? I shouldn't capitalize at, right? No. Okay. That was a dumb okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not the, not a. Uh, uh, no. I don't think of, no. Yeah. I know either. I can go with this yeah. 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 You could. You know, look up all of it. Yeah. But then it's not what you can tell me. Um, <coughs> the references, the heading. Do I? Do I? Do I? Do I? Do I? Do I? 
consultation, I'm going to limit people to two back-to-back -back appointments at most. I've had, at one point I had somebody who had signed up for six in a row, and I'm like, uh, no, you cannot have me for two hours straight when everybody else needs to come talk to me too. Now, if you come to meet with me and there's nobody signed up to meet with me after, then you're welcome to stay. I'm not going to kick you out and go, sorry, time's up, get out of here. I'm going to go get sushi done at the cafeteria. 
Um, no, I'll sit there and keep working. But uh, please don't sign up for more than two appointments back to back because I want to give everybody, you know, if they want to come see me, I want to give them a chance. And if you see, you're looking at the schedule, you're like, I see you put up all these hours, none of them still work for me, what do I do? Let me know, we'll see what we can work out. Okay. Um, but also, 